The aftermath of the war, remembrance of the war, commemoration of the war, uh, Ireland has had a somewhat difficult relationship with how it should commemorate the First World War, but we're not alone. There are lots of other states who have very similar problems. Absolutely. That's, that's indeed the case. Um, I mean, for the, I think one of the, one, one of, one of the, the first and, and, and most difficult problems, of course, was for the defeated states. What do you do with the war dead when you're defeated? It's a real problem, as it was to be for the Germans and the Japanese after the Second World War. And it was therefore one of the disturbing elements for the Germans. So the British and the French could say, um, and by and large the British Empire could say, the cost was terrible, we had to fight, we won. And therefore, uh, that in a sense freed them up to invent national commemorative rituals to acknowledge the cost. There was, there was very little sense of... Um, of um, a triumphalism on anybody's part after 1918. The cost has simply be too, been too great, the catastrophe too obvious to everybody. And so what comes to dominate are the rituals of mourning and commemoration, the two-minute silence, the unknown soldier, which are invented at almost the same time in 1919, 1920 in London and in Paris. The Germans can't do that. The Austrians can't do it. The Hungarians can't do it. So that's the first problem. And that means that the, 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 the very act of commemoration remains deeply disturbing in those countries because one of the ways of commemorating, of mourning the lost soldiers, is to fight the war all over again to a different conclusion. And so in, in a very real sense, Hitler is the German unknown soldier, and he does precisely that. But there are other countries, those that have emerged as a consequence of the war, for whom the the, 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 therefore, the First World War has been absolutely central, but for them it's a pre-national or a pre-nation state, let me say, memory. The case of Poland is a very good example. In the Poland is divided between Germany, Austria and Russia before the war, has been since the end of the 18th century. Four million Poles fight in all three armies on opposite sides. Um, 400, probably 400,000 Poles die. But it, when the, 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 the Polish War Memorial is set up in Warsaw with the unknown soldier, it commemorates the post-war war between, Russia, between Poland and the Ukraine. So for the Poles, it remains a, a, a pre-nation state war, and there's almost no interest in the First World War in Poland uh, contempor in, 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 in contemporary terms. And the same is true of other parts of Eastern Europe as well. You've spoken, or uh, written and spoken about transnational histories and uh, that being a way of commemoration. What, what do you mean by that? I think what I mean by um, transnational histories is, 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 is a recognition that the interaction between different nations and empires, because we're not just talking about nations, was what really made the, um, the First World War. It's, if you like, the reciprocity of the violence. I mean, let me give you an example. If you were a pigeon, and this is not a good position to be in, but if you're a pigeon flying over the Western Front at any point between 1914 and 1918, what do you see? You don't see the national armies in terms of which the history is usually written. What you see is men fighting exactly the same war from different sides, trying to kill each other, learning from each other, interacting and taking different consequences away from it after the war. To me, that's an example of how only a transnational history can really get at that process. But once analytically one's seen it in that way, it surely means that the commemoration has to be something which embraces the human tragedy which embraces all of the peoples who were involved in those, those dynamics, those logics of um, violence. There's another sense in which I would use the term transnational. It comes back to your, your earlier question about a global war. If you go to Japan currently, for example, you find there's an enormous interest in the First World War because, Japan, it, it, because 1418 for the Japanese was that moment between the Russo-Japanese War, when they first really um, get a strong foothold in East Asia, and the Second World War, when they sense the decline of Western power and see looming the real conflict with Woodrow Wilson and the Americans who've been the peacemakers in 1919. Uh, so in a very different perspective to uh, uh, Europe, the First World War nonetheless is hugely important in Japan. Take the case of China. The Chinese are hugely interested in the First World War because 150,000 Chinese indentured laborers, laborers were sent to the Western Front. Um, and indeed, more generally, um, this was the first time in history that colonial men had come from what was seen as the periphery of the world to continental Europe. So we have these transnational movements which aren't just peripheral, they're actually at the heart of the war and understanding it. So given that contextualisation uh, of commemoration, what would you like to see Ireland doing over the next four years in terms of commemoration? <coughs> Uh, it's it, it, historians, I think, shouldn't shouldn't um, prescribe, and uh, and I wouldn't you know I wouldn't presume to uh, to do that. 
Um, I think it's obviously, um, I understand entirely uh, the importance of the issue in terms of our, our own national politics, our relationship with, 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 with Northern Ireland and with, with the UK more generally. And so uh, there will of course have to be a number of, um, probably the, the fewer the better, but what I would call 21 gun salute occasions. Okay, the, the formal occasions went absolutely properly and correctly. Governments have to decide what official meaning they wish to place on episodes in the past. And I think that um, just continuing and deepening what we've already started to do, which is acknowledging the, the Ulster Unionist perspective on the war, but in a reciprocal sense, so that that also means in Northern Ireland an understanding of an appreciation of the, uh, the Easter Rising and the War of Independence. This is, this, this is all important. But you know in the way that in Ireland, partly as a result of the First World War, right from the very start in the free state we always had that view that while we were locked into relations with the north and the, and the and, and the uk there was a way in which as a small nation we also were free to have a larger vision of the world which, which explains the 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 role that the irish played that we played in the league of nations in the 20s and 30s why wouldn't we do something of that in the commemorations at a european and at a global um, level for example i know that we'll be involved in the the gallipoli commemorations because the irish 10th Division fought in Gallipoli. But Gallipoli was intimately related to the genocide that was at the heart of the First World War of, of, the, of, of over a million Ottoman um, Armenians who were killed. And I think there is no reason why Ireland can't simply use in a, in a, in a, in a suggestive kind of way the frameworks of memory to say that there's a, there's a European and a universal um, understanding of the First World War, which we'd also like to encourage. Um, and, and I think that would be a very appropriate thing that we, that we, that we, that we could do and, and probably should do.